This is the sprawling city of Karachi, the commercial capital of Pakistan and an important port. But 430 kilometers north along the Indus was once another city which was the bustling heart of a civilization over 4,000 years ago. Mohenjo-daro. In this episode of Lost Cities, we access some rare pictures and views of the city, taking you on a tour of it with Pakistani archaeologist and author Parveen Talpur, who was part of the team that catalogued the material from the last excavation in Mohenjo-daro in 1965. She went on to research the Indus Valley Civilization at Cornell University in the US and has written numerous books on Mohenjo-daro and the Indus Valley Civilization. This is an aerial view of Mohenjo-daro. The iconic protrusion that you see dominating the landscape is what remains of a much later Kushan era stupa which would have been built only about 2000 years ago. The rest of the city goes back to between 2600 and 1900 BCE. Interestingly, what you see in the site today is just one third of the city. Two thirds of it is still buried underground and has not been excavated. From the size of the city, we know that in its prime, Mohenjo-daro was one of the biggest cities of the Indus Valley Civilization. What worked for it was its location. I think Upper Sindh was the most logical location for Mohenjo-daro, the largest city of Indus Civilization, to emerge and to flourish. Of course, the main reason is the river itself. But then the coincidence that the river traversed from this most fertile patch of Sindh, that makes a difference. It boosted the agriculture. There might have been surplus production, which gave enough time to the inhabitants to indulge in finer aspects of life, creativity, spirituality, craftsmanship. And then there were roads leading to Mohenjo-daro so it had access to transport its goods, its raw materials, its crafts, and even its ideas to distant lands. And because there were not only roads, there were the river traffic, the river was quite close, and the people can bring the goods to Mohenjo-daro, and then they could be transported uh, through River Indus uh, towards the Arabian Sea coast, from there, they could, they, through maritime routes, they went to the Persian Gulf and as far as Mesopotamia. Uh, so there were lots of uh, routes uh, in this whole network. I think Mohenjo-daro had a very central position. So it, it had the commercial significance. It was also uh, obviously in th that context, uh, a cultural hub and also the administrative headquarters. We do not know much about the administration and how uh, it was controlled, this whole civilization. But being the largest city, uh, whatever the system was, it had to be uh, centered at Mohenjo-daro. We don't know what kind of ruling authority was there. Uh, was it male or female? Was it a theocracy? Was it democracy? What is, uh, was it a matriarchal system? Uh, after all, we have found so many mother goddesses, figurines over there. So we don't know much about the administration and the ruling authority, uh, but it seems that uh, logically Mohenjo-daro has to be the center of all that. For much of history, Mohenjo-daro remained hidden. It was about a hundred years back that archaeologist Dr. R. D. Banerjee connected the objects that he found here to the site of Harappa and with it the Indus Valley Civilization. 
Banerjee, who was with the Archaeological Survey of India, had come to study the stupa here. Until then, Mohenjo-daro was just one of the many mounds scattered around Sindh. The locals did not have any memory of the city that had once lived under that mound. Uh, they just simply called it, and I guess they had been referring to it since generations, uh, as Mon Jodaro, which is a Sindhi word, which means uh, Mount of the Dead. And that actually became the name of the city. Uh, obviously, it got anglicized, uh, but uh, that's what it means. And it is strange, you know, because uh, uh, in rural Sindh, there are lots of uh, um, mounds, and they have certain name. Uh, like, for instance, before Mohenjo Daro, Kahu Jodaro was excavated. Now, Kahu has to be somebody's name, Kahu Jodaro means mount of Kahu, then Chanu Daro means uh, mount of Chanhu, uh, Joder Chodaro. But somehow this site must have been so ancient that people even forgot the actual name and they started referring to it as Mohan Jodaro. So there was an element of uh, fear uh, and in fact a superstition. I don't uh, remember where, but in one of the original sources it has been mentioned that there was this superstition that if anybody climbs this mound, uh, he or she will turn blue. Perhaps uh, that worked and it kept the treasure seekers away and the, um, and the city was, uh, was preserved for so many centuries for the archaeologists to come and excavate it. When Banerjee saw it for the first time, he describes it as a mound, uh, which is about 70 to 80 feet high, and it was actually standing, uh, standing between the waves of smaller mounds. Now these smaller mounds, some of these you can still see if you go to the site, and if you excavate these, Perhaps there are more structures under these. Between 1922 and 1965, a series of excavations were carried out on the site of Mohenjo-daro and they have helped us imagine how the city would have been. Many objects that we know today as iconic symbols of the Indus Valley or Harappan civilization were found here. Take, for example, the famous priest king of Mohenjo-daro. Here is a photograph from the excavation in the 1920s, which captured the moment when the priest king rose from the ruins of his old city. The dancing girl of Harappa was found in the lower city in one of the houses here. Mohenjo-daro is hauntingly beautiful and Parveen Talpur takes us back in time with some rare pictures. To me it looks otherworldly, especially in the uh, glow of the rising sun in the morning when the bricks turn little reddish. It really looks like Martian. That's why I'd say that to me it looks otherworldly. When you reach Mohenjo-daro, at the first sight, you do not see any form. No architectural features are visible uh, unless you really enter the city. So for instance, if you, if you look at it from the museum and you start walking towards the pathway, the first thing that you'll realize that there is a raised part of the city. You can only figure out that there is a uh, circular, a fragment of a circular wall on its tip. But when you enter it, gradually you will notice that there are stubs of pillars. By the way, it, all the structures are roofless. That's another thing that you don't see much form in it. And then you also see uh, the, uh, the stupa. Uh, which is the, I think, the, um, still the highest structure over there. You see the platform on which it stands, and then just cl very close to it is the Great Bath. You can see the stairs 
going deep uh, it's eight feet deep ba uh, pool you can also notice that it is very geometrically uh, constructed structure uh, it's a uh, it's the pool but around it you can see uh, balconies monks quarters you can figure out obviously these are uh, again roofless structures so there's a, this whole quadrangle that area is known as the great bath area which belongs not to the buddhist uh, koshan period but it belongs to the indus period uh, there was uh, a pillared hall you can figure out where those uh, stubs of pillars that you can see and whatever buildings are there they are, they are actually the public buildings used for administration or for religious or ritualistic purposes uh, then the next part is a uh, residential area which is low lying and both these parts are divided by a large area which could be an old creek or an old bed of indus itself uh, we are not sure but they are divided and that area is low lying if you start from the main street again the first thing that you will realize is that it is uh, very straight uh, geometrically done uh, geometrically precise and then the narrow streets the streets by the way are very narrow according to today's standards but again very uh, uh, you see geometry all around you the streets are straight and they crisscross at right angles there are drains that run parallel with the streets even the building uh, blocks the brick itself they uh, are very, the bricks are all uniformed uh, they are standard size uh, not very different from what we use today in sindh uh, so you get a good sense of geometry uh, there is a uh, empty uh, empty lot over there it could be a marketplace it could be a playground uh, there are shops uh houses with multiple rooms some of them double stories with staircases some of them uh, having their own private wells the wells are also brick lined and the bricks used for the lining of the wells are wedge shaped um there is also an industrial area in which you can see the the pits uh, perhaps they were used for and these pits are arranged in a row uh they uh, they may have been used for dyeing the fabric or for uh, tanning leather uh so basically these are the structures uh, that you notice and you notice a lot of geometry uh, in all these features it is at this citadel mound area where you can scan two periods of uh, time one belongs to the historic period which has the buddhist stupa and it belongs to the koshan period and then you have the ancient period of indus civilization so you can see both these periods together in the citadel mount that's what makes it very interesting i like entering it from the main street i like that it's a very broad street um I think it was Mortimer Wheeler again who compared it with uh, the Broadway of New York City uh, and uh, it is said that three bullock carts can uh, pass side by side uh, in this um, in this street easily and then also Benerji's description about a street that ends at the edge of the river uh, that gives you a good picture of the city and that was actually the south end of the city most of the houses were built at the south end and they stood opposite to the citadel mound area so you get a very good picture from these descriptions and when you actually see it then obviously it becomes even more fascinating to you uh, again you know the streets criss crossing each other at right angles uh, drains running parallel to it a uh, river on one side fields on the other side there were roads that led to other cities there was river that led to right to the arabian sea coast we can picture it through these that how the trade 
uh, the cargo was transported, how the merchandise was carried from one place to another, what was the means, the bullock carts, the boats, uh, all these things. The city of Mohenjo-daro was closely connected to the Indus for its survival. The agricultural produce and the artifacts produced here would have been carried down the river to the sea and then to the markets of Mesopotamia and Egypt. Excavations at Mohenjo-daro have revealed that the site was occupied between 2600 and 1900 BCE for a period of 700 years. So what would life have been like during this period? I visualize it as a very busy city with a very brisk trade. Uh, people from all sorts of life, the farming community, the fishing community, the craftsmen, uh, boat makers, bead makers, jewelers, blacksmiths, uh, think of anything, uh, wood carvers. Um, so what I visualize is, for instance, if I, when I see the um, industrial area, where there is this row of pits, uh, which archaeologists feel that perhaps, you know, there was, uh, they used to dye fabrics there. We can imagine it like a, a very organized dhobi cart, more organized than what we have in present days, not that chaotic, uh, chaotic, you know. And then, for instance, Leila Shehzada, uh, a, a world-renowned artist, she had visualized Mohenjo-daro in her, her own way and she had painted beautiful uh, paintings, especially of the women, because in archaeological records we don't see any record of the women. They hardly exist on the margins of history, you know, even in later history. So they, I visualize that women, for instance, like in what Leila Shehzada calls the potter's daughter, I visualize that the potters are working and their daughters uh, sitting next to him doing the fine work, not actually working on the wheel, but on the designs of the pottery. In the same way, embroidery and bead jewelry, still in rural Sindh, these are the things which are, which is, uh, uh, which, which are done by women. So I also visualize that when we say we have discovered bead factories actually at Lothal and at Chanhundaro, I always imagine women working on these beaded jewelry. Of course, there was goldsmiths also, the blacksmiths also. So we have a picture of a very busy city and a very prosperous and happy city. I think there was a lot of entertainment, uh, not only because of uh, one dancing girl, but we have discovered masks so maybe some kind of a theatrical activity. They had a certain concept of theater. Uh, so uh, they had these shows and even the children, they were entertained, I think. And children themselves, they might have made so many uh, figurines, birds, uh, male and female figurines, uh, like the village kids in Sindh, they still make. So I think uh, lots of activities and then coming out of the city, in the fields, on the roads, uh, I imagine bullock carts coming from the, because in the later texts, uh, when you describe, when you see the description of the roads, there are special roads just made for the cattle, for the bullock carts. So bringing in and out uh, the, uh, the produce from the fields, and also the goods coming from other Indus civilization cities. For instance, uh, flint was imported to Mohenjo-daro. What was imported, uh, exported from Mohenjo-daro to Rohri, we do not know. But Rohri is one place where there was this inland trade. There was Chanhu-daro, beads were made there. And maybe they came to Mohenjo-daro and then something went towards uh, uh, Chanhu-daro in exchange they may have some barter system or whatever and which then on the larger scale it goes to the river and through the river waterways and other cities all this network and just imagine Mohenjo-daro at the center of this whole network and then it goes extends as far as Mesopotamia through maritime routes. While the river Indus acted as a spine around which Mohenjo-daro grew and prospered it was also a source of great anguish. 
This is a recent visual of the flooding of the Indus, a much too regular phenomenon that continues to cause great damage. Indus is notorious for changing courses and so are its tributaries. Just behind my village is one of the ancient most tributary and you can guess from its name, it's known as Puran. Puran was uh, the easternmost tributary of river Indus. It was active until the times of Alexander the Great. In fact, there is a legend that perhaps Alexander the Great on his way back sailed through Puran. Anyway, uh, Puran gets flooded and so we imagine even Indus itself when it gets flooded, how much havoc it must be causing to, uh, to the villages and the cities within its vicinity. In 1964, I witnessed this flood. Uh, it happened because of Puran and during those flood days, my father spoke about the floods that he had seen the similar floods when he was a little boy. So it seems that after after every few decades or maybe a century, uh, Puran, uh, it, it causes havoc and so does Indus. So in Mohenjo-Daro, uh, archaeologists have identified seven layers of occupation and perhaps these happened because the inhabitants had to move out of the city and when the water receded they came back they rebuilt it reconstructed it and that is how layer after layer was built uh, there is not much change of artifacts from the beginning to the end of these layers that's why we don't think that there was any uh, 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 that the displacement happened due to any other reason like an invasion or anything it was due to the floods and this is i think a psychology uh, of uh, human beings that when we moved out from our village and all the villagers were uh, were settled temporarily near the irrigation canal which is the raised ground we even my father thought that let's build a new village here and start living here because we are very close to the Puran otherwise. But after I think when the water receded and people started to go back to their homes to get some stuff, um, they thought they became nostalgic or something happened. And even my parents wanted to go back to their old house and reconstruct it and start living there. So we never made a new village. We started living back in that village. And I always imagine that this must have been uh, uh, that this must have been uh, to Mohenjo-daro inhabitants also uh, at multiple times. In fact, even today, the area is at risk. There are growing concerns about the rising water table in the region and the risk it poses to the still buried city under it. Almost two thirds of Mohenjo-daro remains buried. There have been no excavations on the site since 1965. There were three main reasons for that. The first was the water logging. The second was the salinity problem, which is a problem all over Sindh. I have seen with my own eyes, you know, even uh, modern structures, uh, you know, uh, falling victim to salinity. They get corroded by the salt borne air and uh, the exposure to the air. So the exposed uh, um, uh, architectural remains of Mohenjo-daro, they have this threat of the uh, salt borne air which corrodes the bricks. And then there is the water logging problem which is underground and which is, uh, you know, uh, damaging the foundations of the architecture. And the third threat is from the Indus itself. Uh, the you know it's changing courses it's flooding uh, which had happened in the past uh, at Mohenjo-daro. Now in 1965 when George Dales uh, was excavating Mohenjo-daro he did uh, borings at three specific uh, points and uh, he discovered that one of the borings showed that there was a human occupation which was 39 feet deep which means 
that we have structures which can be that deep which can take us back in history uh, in times uh, more uh, um, more older than the mohenjo daro period itself but unfortunately we could we cannot do that after 1965 because these were submerged actually the water locking problem was detected by mortimer wheeler in 1950 when he uh, realized uh, the moisture on the bed of the trench of, of the trench that he was working uh, and he had brought it to the notice um, of the authorities and by 1965 when george dates was working uh, i already mentioned that you know the water table had risen so much that now we could not go further uh, the problem of water uh, water logging had started with the construction of sakhar baraj uh, sometime in the early 20th century it was constructed and it was a, a big blessing for the agricultural community Uh, the landlords uh, around uh, that region they got a good opportunity to do the paddy cultivation uh, which was uh, more productive but it required standing water so the standing water of the paddy fields and the uh, the extra water the excess of water in the area which was collected because of the uh, sakhar um, sakhar barrage all these factors they contributed in the rising of the water table underground so that is why the underground structures cannot be excavated now mind you what we are seeing according to one estimate we are seeing only one third of the city of the mohenjo daro two thirds are still submerged in the waters in 1973 the government of pakistan uh, the department of archaeology especially they had uh, made a master plan which they presented to UNESCO and then UNESCO declared Mohenjo Daro as an endangered site because of these three threats in the master plan uh, there were suggestions how to control these uh, how to control the rising water table and how to suck the water which is already collected there so one of the suggestions was uh, the construction the installation of tube wells and hundreds of tube wells were installed which sucked the water from underground and drained it in the dadu canal which is uh, another irrigation canal closer to mohenjo daro so i guess the you know still mohenjo daro is under threat and people are preserving uh, with mud plaster at the most you know whatever they can they, they can do that is being done After the site was discovered by Dr. R. D. Banerjee, Mohenjo Daro was excavated by some of the leading archaeologists. The last excavation of Mohenjo Daro was conducted by Dr. George Dales from the University of Pennsylvania in 1965. After that, excavations here were banned. The cataloging of all that Dales and team found was done in the early 80s. and Parveen Talpur was part of the team that catalogued the material that was unearthed I met George Dales at a UNESCO symposium sponsored by uh, by UNESCO in collaboration with government of uh, Pakistan uh, George Dales uh, was the director of South Asia and Southeast Asia Department of the University of California Berkeley and he was the last archaeologist who had excavated Mohenjo Daro in 1965 because after that uh, the excavations uh, had been banned so i'm talking about the symposium of 1979 so he came after these many years uh, actually to uh, examine catalog Uh, and write a book on the artifacts that he had uh, discovered uh, and he eventually wrote excavations of mohenjo daro the, the pottery of mohenjo daro it was uh, specifically on the on the pottery of mohenjo daro i think it was a very important book which was published later in 1988 uh, but before that when he wanted to catalog uh, and examine uh, 
uh, he had to work uh, in Pakistan at the Department of Explorations and Excavations where all his artifacts uh, were stored. So I was very excited uh, that uh, everything was in Karachi. So I asked him if I can work with his team and he was uh, very kind. Uh, he gave me the opportunity so uh, to work with the American team in Pakistan, which was a big thing at that time, especially for, uh, for a woman to do. So I was very happy about all that. So my experience uh, was, uh, I was obviously a novice. Uh, the first thing I saw these uh, artifacts in black cotton bags, uh, the string bags, and then there were tables laid for the whole team to work, different tables. It was a big hall at the excavation and exploration branch of the archaeology department. And these bags, the string was uh, loosened and the artifacts were thrown into a tray in front of me on the table. And then my job was to uh, label it with the black ink. And the other team members, they did other work. I was very fascinated that 5,000 years old um, artifacts from Mohenjo-daro are passing from my hands. I saw a lot of stuff, you know, uh, broken handles of the jars, uh, a broken, um, you know, so many broken spouted cups, uh, dishes, plates, dishes on stand, uh, figurines, uh, human figurines, uh, male and female, uh, birds, uh, animals, uh, toys, balls, uh, cone-shaped, uh, unidentifiable objects. Uh, there were so many things that were really unidentifiable. Uh, the pottery itself, for instance, you know, parts of the perforated jars, I, we don't know, we used to talk about it, that what was the purpose of this, you know, perforated pottery. Uh, so there were lots of fascinating things and I was more fascinated to see when the other team members, where they were like putting these uh, pot shirts together, like puzzle pieces, putting them together and actually creating a jar out of that, reconstructing a jar or a plate or a dish on a stand. Uh, beautiful pottery, you know, they did. Uh, so it was a very good experience. Um, I must remember at least, I must mention two members uh, of the team. One was Barbara Dales, uh, George Dales' wife. A uh, very industrious woman, very intelligent and very friendly. Uh, she, she was uh, definitely an asset to the team. And then Jonathan Mark Canoyer, uh, who was uh, at that time student of George Dales and who at present is the project director of the Harappa project. Ever since George passed away, uh, Mark has been working on the, on the Harappa site. And by the way, the book that uh, George Dates wrote, it is also co-authored by Mark Kenoyer. So both Jonathan Mark Kenoyer and George Dales, they had written this book. I find this book very important. I think it is the most important book after uh, John Marshall's uh, Indus Civilizations, three volumes that he wrote, because it does not only cover George Dales' uh, uh, findings, but also of Mortimer Wheeler's because uh, Leslie Elcock, who had worked with M Mortimer Wheeler in the 1950s at Mohenjo-daro, he had also contributed in that book S because there was, of course, a lot of uh, pottery and artifacts that uh, Mortimer Wheeler had not yet catalogued. The artifacts that Parveen catalogued were the last of the finds from the city of Mohenjo-daro. Much of what was found has been stacked in museums, but scholars like Parveen have spent decades researching the material found to reconstruct the story of Mohenjo-daro.